Do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life, they said. There is no downside to a side hustle. There are only benefits to building more than one source of income. A side hustle is the new job security, Forbes said. One income stream isn't enough for many people to make a comfortable living these days. Luckily, there are a myriad of ways for a working professional to make money on the side. So many, in fact, that it can be difficult to settle on just one, Forbes said again. As someone with three jobs and three side hustles, I can tell you that I feel neither secure nor like I'm never working a day in my life. I feel like I'm working every single day of my life and then moonlighting on nights and weekends on top of it. So in this video, we're going to talk about the cruel irony of late stage capitalism and the precarity it offers us while masquerading as freedom. What happens psychologically when you commodify your passions and turn what you love into a business that you need to keep up or else? And because one of my side hustles is creating political, economic, educational content on YouTube, some of the uncomfortable pitfalls of turning activism in the form of education and agitation into a source of income. In doing research for this video, I noticed a number of financial outlets promoting the idea that starting one or more side hustles is a great way to eke out some kind of living amidst the precarity of our economic moment, which was heightened by the global pandemic. Writing for Forbes magazine, Jennifer Barrett writes that The growth in side hustles and freelance work began long before the pandemic. More than 57 million Americans freelanced part-time or full-time in 2019, representing about 35% of the total workforce. But that number's risen even more since the pandemic as those who lost work have sought out new income sources to cover bills and full-time workers have picked up extra work to bolster their savings in the face of a slowing economy and uncertain future. Upwork economist Adam Ozemek cites the economic uncertainty that followed the spread of the pandemic and the closure of businesses as push factors that led millions of people into side hustles and freelance work, and importantly, a growing demand among businesses to hire independent professionals on contract for less money than they would have to pay full-time employees with benefits, etc., as the cruel contradictions of capitalism intensify. Remember that to keep profit accumulation going, capitalists will always want to squeeze more work out of people for less money and without having to give them benefits. And we're at a point now where wealth has been concentrated into so few hands that it appears that side hustles are just necessities. Because how foolish, how foolish to think that one or multiple jobs should be enough to cover your living expenses. In 2020, in the midst of the pandemic slowdown, a Dollar Sprout survey found that 27% of respondents relied on their side hustles to pay their monthly bills. Forbes does note that there are some pitfalls to relying on side hustles or freelancing for your income, including not receiving adequate health care or benefits. Uh, in Canada, basic health care is covered, but if you don't have benefits, then you won't have dental covered, you won't have prescription drugs covered, and these things can add up, believe me, unless you want to just forego them entirely because who needs health? Other pitfalls include potentially having a more challenging time managing your taxes, etc., and not getting any paid time off, leading to just constant work and zero boundaries. I scored this job thanks to a friend in a multinational corporation, in a, in a big uh, advertising multinational corporation. I'm under this regime uh, in Spain, uh, which is called falso autonomo or fake or false um, freelancer. Here's the deal with, uh, with that thing. Uh, I pay my own taxes. I pay what, what they say quota de autonomos, which is like a, a fixed fee for social security. And uh, on top of that, I pay my income tax uh, and I pay the VAT, uh, the value added tax, and I do everything on my own. Uh, of course, I'm not an employee, so I don't have a right to paid holidays. I don't have the protections that come with being a, an employee under a, what we call contrato fijo or a stable contract in Spain, which has many advantages and protections like paid sick leave, uh, paid holidays and, you know, labor laws uh, for employees in Spain are really good, but uh, laws for freelancers are obnoxious. We, we don't get things like um, unemployment uh, insurance. 
when we run out of business, we run out of business and it's our responsibility. We pay our own taxes and we have to pay um, a manager. Let's say like a, we have to pay a business manager or, a, you know, gestor. And on top of that, you know, they're allowed to to pay you with uh, up to 60 or 90 days of um, delay, but you have to pay your taxes in time. So you make like a bill on January, another on February, and another on March, for instance. And uh, uh, in April, you have to declare the VAT and uh, income tax for January, February, and March, but you haven't gotten paid yet. And uh, that's, uh, that's tough, that's tough. It's very, very difficult being a freelancer. And when you're a false freelancer, a freelancer with, freelancer with only one customer and integrated in a, in a team relationship and uh, dynamics and everything is, is, <laughs> is really tough. However, they and other outlets still champion side hustles as a way to close the income gap, make ends meet, and maybe even start to build some savings. But as I spoke about with Dr. Richard Wolf, the pandemic was more of a crisis of capitalism than of anything else. Especially since the neoliberal turn in the 1970s, the wage stagnation, outsourcing, automation, attacks on unions, the privatization of state assets, and the rollback of social safety nets, and the rise of the gig economy has all created such a state of precarity that 78% of workers in the US are living paycheck to paycheck. About one third of adults only have a couple hundred dollars in savings in their bank accounts and couldn't cover a $400 emergency, and a third have zero in savings. The pandemic job losses resulted in a rise of homelessness and extreme food insecurity because we have an economic system where food and shelter are commodities that we need to hustle for to keep receiving and where we can't even weather a short slowdown in economic production and growth without the entire system falling apart. And of course, we have the armed arms of the state, the militarized police forces moving in and violently evicting homeless encampments, which they are still doing to this day in Toronto. Please everyone support the Encampment Solidarity Network or similar organizations local to you. So you can't keep up in this economy, especially with rising house prices, even through the pandemic, house prices skyrocketed through the pandemic. So you can't keep up, but you also can't be homeless. That's not allowed. So you just, you just can't be. If our system wasn't predicated upon ever increasing profit and growth, people could have been paid to stay home, to have adequate paid sick leave and medical coverage. We could relocalize food systems and build community resiliency among so many other options. The solution is building a social, ecological, economic system that makes sense and that is divorced from the highly polluting rat race not more precarious ways of procuring money within the system, like side hustles or crowdfunding, especially within an environment of rampant inflation and feudalism, basically, when it comes to housing. The truth is, pandemic or not, precarity has been an increasing factor of life in our economic moment. As I just talked about, the processes since the neoliberal turn have played into this, but this is also endemic to capitalism itself. One way that capitalism as a system ensures the perpetual accumulation of profits into fewer and fewer hands is by ensuring that there's an ever-growing reserve army of labor, or people who have been otherwise shut out of other opportunities basically made superfluous to capital, and who will be available and desperate enough to work long hours for very low pay. I made a video on this years ago, which is probably cringe now, but very informative, so I won't go too far into this here. But the pandemic was a major driver of a quick increase in this reserve army of labor. And the gig economy and the increasing tendency of businesses to hire freelancers instead of salaried employees with benefits really preyed on the fact that this reserve army of labor has grown tremendously. I mean, the tendency of businesses to not hire salaried workers anymore is itself one of the drivers of the expansion of this pool of laborers. Knowing that people have fewer and fewer options and rising and rising costs, businesses were able to spin this new way of working as a form of freedom. And we hear all the time that actually millennials and Zoomers, we love the gig economy, we love this kind of work because we value freedom. Freedom from benefits and sick leaves. Yay! Freedom from 
economic security of any kind. The sick thing is that a lot of young people today are clued in to how the system works, and they do realize just how bad things will continue to get for the next generations, and they're ready to opt out. There was a whole I don't dream of labor internet movement not too long ago where a lot of people were feeling like they wanted to opt out. In my opinion, a lot of them didn't go far enough in their critiques of capitalism, and so they landed on that they just wanted to do YouTube or sell things online in order to make ends meet, which often other people still have to make those things that you're selling, and so you're just kind of becoming the exploiter, but doing so from the comfort of your own home. There's also a more politically inclined anti-work movement. There's also a not politically inclined at all, usually tiny house movement. And if you watch people talking about their reasons for moving into trailers, basically, I mean, of course, some of them are very luxurious, but for most of them, it's that they don't want to be held back by a mortgage or rent, which would necessitate that they have to work at least a third of their lives, probably well over a third of their lives, to make other people rich. They want to have the time, space, and energy to actually pursue things that are meaningful and fulfilling to them and that create a feeling of self-actualization. Now, of course, you need money and time to even build a tiny house, so it's really not accessible to most people. I'm not saying that it is. What I'm saying is that people everywhere, even people who are not politically inclined, are cluing in and they're wanting to opt out of this ridiculous system. But framing side hustles or the gig life as the way to do that, as the new job security, that's a slap in the face. Just right in the face. Side hustles carry on the trend of hyper-individualization under late-stage capitalism where we're all asked to be entrepreneurs of ourselves, brands in and of ourselves, competing with all of the other tired and overworked people who come home from their day jobs and try to make it as a podcaster or a freelance artist who become brands in and of themselves. And the markets are saturated, y'all. How many new podcasts sprung up during the pandemic? How many online boutiques? I mean, there are very few niches that continue to be niches today. And with social media, I mean, the amount of time and energy that you need to put into marketing yourself as an entrepreneur of yourself on social media can be a full-time gig in itself. Holly Exley made a great video on this regarding freelance artistry and social media and the growing and growing demands and expectations placed on artists who want to have anyone actually see their work. So go check it out. In short, the competition that we each face in our side hustles increases exponentially as more and more people are channeled into that reserve army of labor, become entrepreneurs of themselves. So freedom, security, not for most. Another important aspect to this is what does it do psychologically when you commodify and try to market something that you love? What does it do to your psyche when you can't even enjoy things anymore without thinking, hey, can I monetize this? When you can't just read or take in a piece of media without thinking, hey, can I mine this for content? So here we get into intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. When you're passionate about something, you love doing it, you have intrinsic motivation. You're doing it because it brings you joy, it gets you going, it gives you life. Extrinsic motivation is when you're doing it for something external, some external reward or push factor like money or economic precarity. Turns out, and this is probably not surprising, that coming to rely on extrinsic motivation for doing a thing will often kill or lessen your intrinsic motivation for doing so. And I would say this is probably especially true when the extrinsic motivation is not just a bonus or a reward, but an actual pressing need, like you need to do this thing to weather economic precarity. According to the APA, combining extrinsic motivation to an intrinsically motivated behavior will reduce your intrinsic motivation. This is called the overjustification effect. So in other words, when you add an incentive to something that you already enjoy doing, your interest decreases. When you add extrinsic motivation to a strong activity goal association, it separates the activity and the goal, weakening the association. So when you are turning your hobby into a career, instead of appreciating the hobby for the sake of doing it, you are now focused on the outcome the longer-term incentive of monetization and success. Thus, you begin losing interest in your passion. And I feel like this is somewhat intuitive. I mean, there's nothing like grind culture to just suck the life and joy out of whatever you're doing. There's nothing like needing to constantly produce and market yourself on social media and deal with the people who frequent social media to make you wish that you just 
never had a monetizable passion at all. Probably why I've completely fallen down on it. I've left Twitter. I have Instagram, but I don't use it. My political Instagram is just sitting there languishing. I never post updates. I never post what I'm doing. I mean, maybe stories, but I just... I just can't. And I'm being very critical and negative, aren't I? I mean, I know that this doesn't need to be the case across the board. I am making this video even myself with dreams. I have big dreams of one day creating a communal permaculture project that would likely need to bring in money somehow, maybe through workshops or something like that but I would love to have a decommodified aspect to it as well. Of course, it's better to do something that you actually enjoy, especially if you can do that on your own time and schedule and not be a wage slave in an industry that you don't agree with and that is probably actively harmful to society. But of course you need some level of money and security to even begin projects like that. And I think for most freelancers and side hustlers in this economy, the reality is closer to gig work like exploitation on top of probably already working a full-time job. Given that education and agitation online could be said to be passions of mine, and given that Forbes, again, they have so many pieces championing side hustles, but they listed starting a YouTube channel as number one of the five profitable side hustles that can literally change your life. So here we're gonna talk about some of my issues with YouTube and Patreon as platforms but I want to preface this conversation by saying that I am actually truly so grateful to have this platform at all. I don't take it for granted. It's something that I've wished to have for a really long time. And, you know, it's not the biggest compared to others perhaps, but I'm still so proud of the platform, so proud of the work that I've put out and just so thankful to everyone who has watched, who gets something out of it, takes something away from it. And if I could afford to just garden and do content, I would, and maybe one day. And I do think it's an incredible privilege to have been able to make any money on this platform at all. Um, and to have the support that I've had, it's, it's been incredible. So yeah, I wanna thank my patrons. They're the best people in the world and they got me through so many tough times between my chronic illness and between me actually losing work during the pandemic. And look at that, falling back on my side hustles, just like, just like the statistics I listed before. So everything that I say doesn't negate any of that, but considering this as being promoted as a path to freedom and economic security, I would like to offer some caution on accepting that framing. So I started my channel several years ago when I was finishing my PhD, and because I had an autoimmune condition and a migraine condition that I was struggling with, I was moving fairly slowly and I found that I had time every day where I just could not look at screens anymore. And so I started to write scripts, like analog scripts, based on my research and based on a passion for sharing my research on the contradictions of capitalism and political economy and why it was so important that we radically transform ours. So it was purely a form of education and agitation. I never dreamt it was something I would ever make money from. And I never dreamt that it would even reach as many people as it, it's reached. And my channel was monetized eventually, but I started after AdSense made changes to their policies where subsequently creators were making far, far less. Kelgore made a fantastic video about this, so I won't go too much into the ad money aspect of it. Please check out her video. But especially since I'm posting much less now, I make next to nothing in ad money. Um, for reference, Positive Leftist News, the entire history of Positive Leftist News on the internet has made about 100 Canadian dollars after tax because they withhold tax. So take that to the bank. But then came Patreon. And because I was hardly making any money at all as a grad student and because I was putting a lot of hours into laboring to make my videos, I was extremely grateful for the chance to make, you know, any money at all for the work that I was doing. And eventually it became enough money that, you know, I couldn't live on it, like I could never live on it. And I think a lot of people 
think that about you know medium-sized youtubers that they're just bringing in all this cash but if you actually add up the number of hours that it takes to put something out and what you're actually making you're making well under minimum wage well 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 under so i couldn't live on it but i did come to rely on it because combining that with all of the other precarious jobs that i was doing including contract sessional lecturing which can be highly exploitative contract research and contract gardening and landscaping I could combine all of this precarious contract work together to make an okay living. So I guess I would be part of the 27% of respondents on Dollar Sprout who came to rely on their side hustles to pay their bills. And the dream, I mean the dream even now, like I said, would be to just garden and make content. And I'm also writing children's books, so doing that, that that would be lovely. That would be the dream, wouldn't it? And when you come to rely on it, I think psychologically you think like, well, hey, yeah, I could I could keep building this up and maybe just do this. And wouldn't that, wouldn't that be such a privilege? And it would, right? But there's a huge catch 22 actually, because I was growing things up actually. There was a time that I was putting things out and growing things up, but as the prices of everything rose, including housing, housing was the big one, I had to take on more other work, which then just eroded the time that I had for content. So, you know, three jobs is more than enough, especially if I want to somewhat take care of my health and well being, but then add in a podcast and three YouTube channels, which is probably my fault for starting so many projects, but. They're all so different and unique and I really love doing them all. And there's nothing more frustrating than getting creative inspiration for a project and not being able to execute on it because you're working several other precarious jobs. Creativity and passion isn't something that you can just force into your day. Like, oh, I've, I've got half an hour now. Let's, gotta, let's bang out some creativity. That's not how it works. So I think I'm just lamenting the realities of job insecurity in this economic moment where unless you're willing to work yourself to death, which I nearly did, it's very, very easy to just slowly lose any of the time that you had, you once had for for your passions or your creative projects. And then it's just a vicious cycle because the less time that you have to create and execute, the more people will drop off your Patreon, which makes complete sense, obviously. But then that means that you have to take on more work outside of that, meaning you have even less time to create. And the cycle just continues and continues until you're slowly just boxed out completely of being able to justify taking the time for your passions or your creations because you need to support yourself. And the nature of Patreon as a crowdfunding program also means that your income is always tied to how the economy is doing because when things slow down, when times are tough, of course people are going to pull back on their donations. That makes perfect sense. And every month you're going to lose patrons. That's true for everyone. It's very normal. People's financial situations change all the time. So you're going to be losing patrons every month. Month. If you're posting regularly, that's fine because you make up for that. You bring in new support. Um, but if you're not, you're on this slow trajectory to zero. And I would say, I, this is true for me, I don't know about other people, but the pressure that I feel to put something out every month is so immense even though I am putting things out, right? So I stream every month on a little, little to the left. I do a podcast every month. I produce the positive leftist news every month, which is a ton of work. But because my main channel is a video essay channel, it's always been a video essay channel. I think a lot of people signed up or you know supported me because of that. When I feel like I don't have a video essay, even though I'm still putting out a ton of content, I feel so crushed. I feel like I have just let everyone down. And it's not, it's not the patrons who are making me feel this way. If anything, they're like, hey, we get it. We're anti-capitalists. <laughs> you know, we don't need you to be constantly producing. We understand your situation. It's cool. But you can have the best patrons in the world, which I do. And just the nature of the platform, no matter what, like clockwork every month, I just feel just terrible and I'll be working myself to death in my other jobs and all I can think is oh I just have this crushing anxiety like when am I going to work on my video you know when am I going to do this when am I going to film this and I just try I'm trying to fit it in whenever I can whenever I have you know like half an hour I'm trying to fit it in and it's coming from a place that I don't feel is very joyful <laughs> anymore I feel like it's not coming from a place of genuine expression and you know 
creating at the speed of inspiration, creating because I feel like I have something genuine um, and important to say. And I do, I mean, I have a whole list of videos that I want to make. I have ones that I've been researching for a while now. I have ideas that I'm so excited about that I just don't have the time to execute on. But when I'm trying to think of, well, what can I put out fast? What can I put out in the meantime when I'm trying to, you know, build up to these big projects? And that's another thing, the longer that you don't post, I mean, for me, the more it feels like, well, when I come back, I want to have something really good. And um, I don't want to just put things out for the sake of putting them out. I want to put things out that I'm really proud of and that I feel are really well produced, um, you know, things that are really challenging and disrupting the space, the discourse, things that are novel, things that aren't just, you know, I don't know. So I, I'm really interested in doing things like the Half Earth video that was more of a documentary style, which I thought was really in depth. But you know, those take a long time. So I'm always trying to think of, well, what can I put out in the meantime? And I just I don't feel like that is really coming from a place of intrinsic motivation, right? It's very extrinsic. And I can tell you that Psychologically, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel great. Tiffany Ferg in a video also talked about the new YouTube analytics, which are so granular. As soon as you put a video out, you can tell immediately how it is ranking compared to, it compares it to all of your other videos. And that itself can be a real mind fuck because those analytics themselves, the likes of views, I mean, that can come to be this conscious or unconscious source of extrinsic motivation, even if you don't want it to be these analytics just kind of smack you in the face every time that you open your YouTube studio. And if, you know, if the analytics are showing a downward trend or, or what, what not, it's, it's difficult to not feel, you know, that extrinsic motivation ending up kind of just soiling the intrinsic motivation that you have. And the algorithm itself, the way the algorithm works is itself a mindfuck because it does not want you to be an occasional creator. It does not want you to really take your time and spend months and months putting out, you know, a great piece that's like a documentary and, you know, really impactful. They want you to be throwing things out at a constant clip so that they can make that ad money because they're surely not paying it to creators, right? And the need, like the need to be constantly posting in order to, you know, beat the algorithm or work with the algorithm and make sure that people are actually seeing your work and that you don't just lose relevancy entirely. I mean, that's the opposite of creative freedom, the complete opposite of creative freedom. Uh, I just wanted to touch on one more thing regarding the pitfalls of turning activism into a source of income. I think one of the main things is that you can start to really give in to groupthink. And this is one of the main reasons why I left Twitter, because I just felt like that was a place that nothing good happened. But I found myself cautious or afraid even to openly support people that I do support, like the proletarian feminists, for example, for fear of losing support, which is absolutely terrible. Like if this is supposed to be my activism and my education and whatnot, but I have this background fear of engaging on these platforms or losing support or whatnot, you know, like if you ever find yourself censoring yourself, watering yourself down, or just passively folding your opinions and your content into what is already acceptable within, you know, online leftist spaces, instead of challenging and disrupting the space, um, I, I don't know, I think that's a problem. So ultimately, I never wanted to care about any of this anyway. I never wanted to actually do this for the money. I mean, there was definitely a time that I was like, man, that would be great. But no, I feel like I just went on this kind of roller coaster ride with Patreon and with this whole monetization of your passions and whatnot. And I feel like I'm kind of coming coming down on the other side and feeling like, all right, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to go back to my roots. I'm ready to go back to just really intrinsic motivation for putting things out, creating at the speed of inspiration, creating out of a true passion and a true feeling like this is something I want to put out. And the sad truth is that during these economic times and with everything that's going on with me right now, which I'll circle back to later, if I'm not making enough money from this, then I do simply lose the time that I need to do it. 
and that's just the way things are. But I'm kind of at a place now where I'm fine if that deceleration spiral continues. I will always be making content in some form because education and agitation is my passion. I think it's very important, but I need to move at a speed that is practical and possible right now without burning out. And I have burnt out so many times, I'm just perpetually burning out. But, you know, if that means that I move slowly and I slowly lose support and I have even less time to work on things, then that's okay. The algorithm's going to absolutely hate it. But like I said before, I'm just, I'm so grateful for everyone who comes across these videos, who takes something away from them. I absolutely love that. And yeah, having it be a passion project and not a side hustle Feels good, feels really right to me. So number one most profitable side hustle that can literally change your life? Maybe, maybe not, but it's that capitalist fantasy again, right? That if you just hustle hard enough, then you too can be one of the chosen ones who, who makes it and who rises above. And it's just really not the reality for most people, especially if you are not white, if you are not male, if you are not able-bodied, or if your presentation style doesn't appeal to the predominantly able-bodied white male audience that unfortunately makes up the bulk of the audience for political content. And I have not announced this publicly to anyone, and this might seem a strange place to make an announcement like this, but I am actually pregnant. My partner and I are expecting due at the end of December, and we are planning to move soon. Currently, I live alone, but I am hoping that we can move far enough out of the city and pool our resources such that my individual cost of living will be lower and I can not work so much and hopefully get back to making more regular content and hopefully maybe one day do the gardening dream, community organizing, gardening, and content. However, I worry. <laughs> that by the time I am actually ready to get back to consistent content creation again, because who knows what things are going to look like when I'm on maternity leave, I probably won't be making a ton of content. So by the time I'm actually ready or, you know, able to do that, will I just need to take on more work again and just box myself out of it? That is the question. So do what you love and... Do what you love and you'll never work a day in your... You'll work super fucking hard all the time with no separation or any boundaries and also take everything extremely personally. So if you're still here with me, thank you so much for entertaining my whinging on side hustles and activism for profit and all of the rest. I hope it was somewhat relatable and cathartic. Once I have moved, I for one will be focusing much more on community organizing and mutual aid projects, which I believe are the only true lasting forms of economic security and ones that transcend the alienation and the forced competition and the grind of this ridiculous economic system that we're living in. Thank you so much to my patrons who give me life and have been so supportive and understanding. I could not have produced any of my work without you. I love the community that we've cultivated on Discord. Thank you a million. Solidarity always.